Hello, and welcome to episode 24 of the Brain Cancer Podcast. I hope you're all doing well, and I am excited to be sitting down to record again today. I want to start off by saying that I had gone back and forth on actually making this episode for quite a few months, but it wasn't until last week when I was talking with my therapist and she encouraged me to create this episode because it is so important and it's something that we will all have to face at some point. No matter what, this will be a difficult conversation to have, but it is very important to have. I want to discuss your end-of-life planning for the sake of trying to break the ice on a very difficult topic to bring up with your family members, your friends, possibly even your own physician. I will provide some links as well that can help point you in the right direction. And I know that there are people from all over the world listening, but I can only speak to how it is for me living in the United States. Even state-by-state differences make it so that I don't have the exact answer to whatever your question might be. So that's why I'm going to provide some resources, because state laws cover different aspects of your end-of-life care, who can do what, who can make what decisions, and who has to be present for some of these decisions to be made. I guess we should start at the beginning by discussing what end-of-life planning actually is. All it means is that as you're approaching the end of your life, even if it's 10, 15, 20 years from now, if something happens, then you still have control over what happens to you in case you're unable to make those decisions in the future. As brain cancer patients, we know just how brutal this disease really is. Any neurodegenerative disease is horrible to have to go through or see a family member go through. And that's why it's important that you have this difficult conversation because you're also helping them and anybody else in the future so that after you do pass or you're unable to make your own decisions, you'll still have peace of mind knowing that you called all the shots. I'm not really sure how to describe it any other way, but it is very important that we take control at this point when we still can. I know it's difficult to even broach the topic with any family members or asking somebody about their planning for the future. And I certainly cannot cover every different religious belief, ethical beliefs, cultural traditions, or anything along that line. So you're going to have to ask yourself what you want and what is important to you. I just want to talk about some of the the terms that you may hear and things that we are somewhat familiar with, but from the perspective of somebody who has already taken some steps, but even I'll admit that I'm still not fully complete on everything that I'm going to talk about here. I actually do have a checklist here so that I can somewhat go in order from start to finish. Step one, you'll want to prepare your end-of-life planning documents. This can be things like your living trust or a living will. And for that, you're going to probably have to consult an attorney for a living trust because that involves more than just a living will. The living will ensures that your wishes about your medical decisions will be followed in case something happens, like you end up unable to express any of your own decisions about your your medical health care. Then we also have your last will and testament. We're all familiar with what a will is. It's a written legal document that breaks down how all of your assets can be handled and what happens to any dependents after you pass. This is also a good time to nominate somebody or two people that you trust as a healthcare proxy. 
the healthcare proxy will be somebody that you trust, that you have spoken to, who will follow your medical wishes in the event that you become unable to make your own decisions. You can also designate what organs or tissues you would like to donate after you pass. Many states do have the, do you want to be an organ donor on your driver's license? And you can check yes or no. But you may have specific wishes. I personally want my brain to go to any sort of brain cancer research so that I can still be contributing to finding a cure for brain cancer for somebody in the future. Once again, some of this will have ethical or religious beliefs, and you're going to have to make your own decisions based off of that. You will have to decide between a will or a trust. There are a couple differences between a trust and a will. A trust is a living document, That goes into effect as soon as you create it and fund it, and it allows for stronger control over your asset distribution. It gives you greater privacy in that you don't have to go to any probate courts, and it gives you a certain amount of protection since your trust owns your assets and your estate will be protected from litigation. You can use a will to name guardians plan for your final arrangements, and state how you want your assets to be passed down. We all have a different amount of assets, and that's going to be a very personal topic, and you're going to have to look at financial assets, real estate, CDs, savings accounts, collectibles, art, jewelry, anything sentimental, which you would like to go to a specific person. So it can take quite a bit of time in planning to figure out what you want going where. And this also helps avoid any potential financial or property disputes by family members in the future who are, for some reason, fighting over a piece of property or some amount of money. To me, that just seems disrespectful to the person that passed. I I just can't figure out why family people would fight like that over money basically when somebody just died from a horrible disease just doesn't make sense to me you may have to also determine how you want your end of life housing to go we all know about nursing homes and they can be a first step in that they provide more care they have activities for people to do There's less worry about having to get yourself to doctor's appointments and you can have food made for you. After the nursing home, you can go to an assisted living facility where they will provide a little bit more medical care and more services. But it's important to not just choose whichever one is convenient. It's important to research which facility you would like to go to read some reviews online, talk to people, and kind of just get a feel for how it might be. Another option would be at-home care. I've known people who are in this exact situation. You want to be comfortable with the person who's coming into your house to help take care of you. Another very, very important thing to consider and plan for in the future are any funeral or burial arrangements. Different religions and cultures have different beliefs. I can't possibly know all of them. But if you can specify what you want or do not want, then you're going to take quite a burden off of your family members after you do pass. I know there are your traditional, like, full funeral services where they take place in the church or the funeral home. Sometimes they also have a viewing day before, which is usually like the open casket. And then there's like a two or three hour period where people can go and visit and pay their final respects. There are the memorial services afterwards where you go out to eat, whatever it might be, a celebration of life or the committal at the grave site where you all go there and there's prayer and flowers. Or if you are choosing to be cremated, 
there is the whole scattering of the ashes ceremony, which is also a very personal thing. Finally, you can also create your own obituary and death notice. If you don't want somebody else writing it for you, you can write your own and you can get quite creative as I've seen some very, very interesting death notices or obituaries. I think for me personally and my personality, that is way better than just Chris just passed peacefully or or whatever it might be. It's just not for me. I just have a very distinct personality and a sense of dry humor. Not everybody gets, but it's something that it's just me. And if I can still be making people laugh and smile on the way out, then that's what I'm going to do. I want to talk about what a DNR is. It is a form that specifies that you do not want any life-saving measures like CPR or intubation. Once any emergency responders or people at the hospital see that you have a DNR, they have to legally stop treating you. With a DNR, they are prevented from doing any sort of resuscitation to you. And in medical terms, resuscitate means the various procedures used by healthcare professionals in an emergency situation to revive a person from unconsciousness or the brink of death. This does include your CPR, chest compressions, defibrillation, intubation, like I mentioned, as well as the mouth-to-mouth resuscitation, which goes with your chest compressions. There are printable forms that you can get online, which I will link in the description. You will have to reference the website because each state has different requirements. It looks like about half or maybe slightly more than half are just between the patient and the physician. There are a few states where you have to have a patient and either a notary public or two witnesses or you have to have a patient and either a witness, a notary public, or a physician. So you'll definitely just have to check and see what it is, because it also references the legal code for that state. Once again, I don't know how any other countries operate in respects to a DNR. In addition, some people have DNR cards that they will carry with them in their wallet or their purse so that when an emergency responder sees it, when they look at their ID, they'll find out that they have a DNR and they will legally have to stop any resuscitation methods that they may be doing. You can also get a like a medical ID bracelet. They do sell DNR bracelets, I think. I'm not sure, but I think I've seen them. Leading from DNR goes right into talking about your healthcare proxy, which is the person who will be making medical decisions in the case that you cannot. It's also a good idea to have a second person as like a backup. And you can put both people on your healthcare proxy documents. I definitely recommend having a healthcare proxy because otherwise, State law determines who makes decisions on your behalf. I don't know about you, but I don't want some lawmaker halfway across the state who doesn't know me making any medical decisions or choosing what happens to me in the event that I cannot make my own decisions. Also, you can change your healthcare proxies at any time. You can revoke your DNR at any time. You can change any of your end-of-life planning documents, like your will, your trust. You can alter these things. They're not final. You can make changes if your situation changes or there's some sort of problem or you have a change of heart. You can always change whatever your decisions might be. And to wrap up all of the talk of your DNR and your healthcare proxy, you can put all of this inside of a living will. This is another situation where state law determines what you need to have and what forms need to be filled out. If you ask your doctor, they will definitely know 
what documents need to be filled out, what needs to get signed. And they will be willing to work with you to make sure that you have the full control over your medical treatment for the rest of your life. But your living will will also have your medical power of attorney or your healthcare proxy to allow them to make medical decisions for you on your behalf. And it also will specify what you want should your quality of life fall so poorly that you're basically being kept alive on ventilators and machines. Do you want to be living for as long as possible or do you just want to be made comfortable? which you can do at home as well with in-home care. For me personally, as this always has been and always will be, I prefer quality of life over quantity of life. I don't want to be kept alive on any machines, any tubes, anything like that, because that's not living to me. That's just my personal belief. It can be very different for anybody else. And I respect anybody else's decisions. Just for me personally, having had a lot of time to think about these things over the past five and a half years, I know what life is to me. Just keep me comfortable over a few days and I'm good. I just want to be happy. I just live every day the best that I can, trying to be the best person that I can. And I know none of us like being in the hospital for very long. And that is not where I want to spend the rest of my weeks or months, whatever it might be. I understand this is a really difficult topic to talk about. It's uncomfortable to even bring it up. It was uncomfortable for me to even start this episode. And I may have had to edit out some things or messed up in a few spots, but I just want to provide as much information as I can so that you can start to make a plan for the future while you still have control. I think we all know how after somebody dies, there's so much that happens all at once. You're trying to make arrangements for funerals and people are sending you stuff and you're getting calls and you're trying to write an obituary and there's just so many things going on. I just think it's a good idea that we can help our family in a way that they can properly grieve after we do pass. It might be difficult to talk to your family about this, and maybe you can take them to a doctor's appointment with you or go to a lawyer who specializes in things like living wills or wills or estate planning and have that conversation. I don't know the laws in every state or the cultural traditions and beliefs of other countries. But I think we can all agree that coming together now, while we are still of sound mind, essentially, to help make things as easy for them, I think that benefits both us and them in the future. In a way, it gives you a sense of control over what happens in the later stages of our lives. It also ensures that whatever we want right now actually happens after we do pass. I know this was a difficult topic for me to talk about today, but I'm glad that I did because I feel it's important for all of us, and I feel it's my responsibility to bring this up for all of you. I always have a really positive attitude towards life and just how I am as a person, but this is something that we all have to plan for eventually, and it's better to plan now while we still can, rather than being too late and then having our family members essentially try and figure out what we want. At a minimum, we should make our healthcare decisions known, either in the form of a living will or DNR, your healthcare proxy, and you can craft a basic will talk to an attorney who specializes in estate planning to get a start on this. 
when we have things like brain cancer, which are horrible diseases, and especially things like glioblastoma, which can really affect our ability to make decisions even within a year or a year and a half or less, like six months. It's important that we try and take care of as much of this stuff in advance as we can. I'm sorry if I just kind of talked a lot, but I want to thank you all so much for listening to me. It really means a lot to me. It really is hard to describe. Just doing this is something that I love doing, and I'm so thankful for all of you. If you would like, please follow the page on Facebook at facebook.com slash brain cancer podcast. I post on there every single day. I always try to include a photo from my travels around town or photos that I've taken, whatever it might be. You can follow me on Twitter at brain cancer pod, where I need to actually do more things. And you can email me at any time at brain cancer podcast at gmail.com. You can email me anytime. I will get back to you as soon as possible. I do check my email a couple times a day, just in case. If you ever need to talk, just let me know. Or if you want to chat on Discord, we can do that. Or if you would like to come on the show and tell your own story, share your experiences with brain cancer, whether as a patient or caregiver, I would love to have some people on. I think that about does it, though. Once again, thank you all so much for listening, and I will be uh, talking to you again soon. I hope you all have a great day or night, and I will talk to you again soon. Bye. Bye.